Hello, and welcome to Zim Explore. I'm Dr. Abstract. And in this Zim Explore, we're taking a look through a code pen called What Color Is This Pumpkin? So let's have a look now at zimjazz.com and then go way down at the bottom, the gold bars, and hit Code Pen, and you can find us there. Here we are. Oh, look at that. So Code Pen is a place where you can make things and share things and it's uh, usually used by front-end developers for the most part uh, it's quite wonderful and there's the challenges and so we did a challenge to make a pumpkin an app with a pumpkin or a page with a pumpkin and this is it so you can see that we've got some animation of the text here and that's wiggling so zim we've got wiggle zim is a javascript canvas framework and Wiggle lets us do all sorts of things, like um, make uh, the scale change, make the position change, and it does so in a random way. And we'll see that as we go through the code. So uh, the code is on the right-hand side here. Here's the game, but we might want to play it. So uh, if we roll over the pumpkin, it gives a little spin like that. But the idea is uh, the pumpkin keeps animating and, and changing color. And now we're going to play and choose the right color. Oh, that's the wrong color. Ah, there's the right color. So when it's right, it's green. There, green. And you, your points go up when it's green. And when it's uh, wrong, it's red and the points go down. So that's right. Let's build up our points a little bit if we can. Oh, 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 that's pretty bright. Is this one? Yeah. And this thing's called a selector right here. And oh, it's wrong. So now I've got the wrong one. That's wrong. This is wrong. And my points are going down. Oh, all right, we've got a play and a pause. Um, so that's the game. It's not terribly easy figuring out what to do with a pumpkin these days. Because, oh, I've done so many things with pumpkins <laughs> um, over the years. So I, I've been making interactive media since the 90s using Director and then using Flash and now using the canvas. And so we've learned how to do these things. We've also made lots of holiday cards. As a matter of fact, if you if you press out to Zim, so anytime you see this, this will take you out to Zim. Um, if you scroll down in Zim, there is, are these 10 banners right here. And one of them is wonder cards. And uh, the canvas is very good for making cards. There's, there's sort of holiday type things. I probably have one with pumpkins in here. <laughs> but anyway, blah, 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 blah. So these are, are oh, there's, this is a code pen with um, a bunch of little spiders. Do you want to see that one? And there's a bunch of little spiders um, walking around in a wiggling. We wiggled here as well, wiggled the points of the blob and the spiders are popping around. But what we do best, I have no idea how to get back to where we were now. Uh, there it is right there. So this is my current, or our current things that we've made in Zim. And you can get through them by going next. So there's the Zim right here. This one's doing quite well, the 3D maze. So anyway, I thought I would take you through some uh, the building of that one. This is a 3D maze where when you hit play like that, uh, then this little cursor follows. Oh, I'm stuck. How do I get, how do I get through this maze? Oh, maybe it was this way. Okay, and we may have done an explore on the 3D maze. I think we might have as well. So we'll pop on back. And I think uh, I'm in an F11 here. I think there's our wonder cards. Here's our original pumpkin, so I don't need to work in this one. Uh, so you get it? We we can make all sorts of holiday things with um, with Zim, but uh, Zim does many more things as well. E-learning apps, generative art. So a lot of our art is also on CodePen. Um, games, uh, puzzles. Okay, so these are the fun, expressive things that you can make with code. So we'd love you to come here and check it out more. There's an editor as well here, so you can um, view many of the things that are in CodePen right in the Zim editor as well. Uh, but we like CodePen for the social aspects and uh, hopefully inspiring people to try out the Canvas. The canvas is absolutely wonderful. Oh, 
on that page, <laughs> darn, on that page, uh, Zim, we have in the gold bars here, so if you can press gold, oh, actually it's not in the gold bars, but up above here are some comparisons. So these are comparisons to Flutter and just regular HTML. Uh, Zim is a tenth of the code, um, and on average, 30, 40% uh, less code than any of these others, Pixie, Phaser, Paper, JS, P5, JS, etc. So if you've worked in any of those, it really makes sense to come take a look at Zim because we're coming in at a lot less code for making similar things. Okay, so you can see reviews and you can press on any of these. Actually, this is uh, a shortened version of it. Here's all of the comparisons that we've happened to make. We could make more comparisons. And many of these comparisons will click you out to CodePen as well. Okay, so CodePen is a good place to showcase work. And without further ado, why don't we take you through what color is this pumpkin? The code for how we did that. We're importing Zim and we're using the game module here because we just wanted to get this little timer is, is a sort of a built-in, oh, that's a score. So we have a timer and a score in the game module amongst other things, but uh, that makes, of course, this could have just been a label and we could have managed it ourselves, but the score has a score property. It's just a little bit easier to operate. Normally, if you're bringing in Zim, you would just bring in Zim like that. Hopefully this is big enough for you to see. It's a little tricky as I try and scale these things. But anyway, there's um, Zim underscore game is our game module. And where you can see more information about that is on Zim under code. Uh, here's our template. So if you're, you, let's see, in CodePen, you don't need the HTML stuff. You saw that we just went from the import. But if you were to make your own page, your own HTML page, this is the Zim template and you just copy that. Okay, and then you start coding, <laughs> start coding down here. Boop. Um, that's not what I wanted to show you though. I wanted to show you what? Under tools, I think it was. What was I wanting to show you? Libraries, ah, libraries. So under libraries, there's the Zim game module and it's got things like a leaderboard and an isometric board and other things. Uh, this is Zim Sockets, so that you can do multi-user. Here's physics, so how to integrate physics, and at, at which point you would integrate Zim underscore physics, Zim underscore game, Zim underscore sockets, etc. There's also Zim in three in 3D with 3JS. Um, okay, so anyway, those are the Zim libraries. There may as well leave that tab open. Okay, so here are references for Zim. That's the main Zim site. There's also an intro example that shows four examples all commented for you to do that. There's a whole learn section, much like we just went to the code section there, a whole learn section with videos and code tutorials. The docs, so when you want to see um, how to do something in Dim. Zim? In Dim. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, and then CodePen. So here we are on CodePen. Yay. Frame, right. Uh, we are a framework. And so what Frame does is it makes this stage for us right here. And we can have various modes for the stage. We're using the fit mode, which will just fit that inside of the browser window or inside of the iframe in this case. Okay, so that's uh, the fit mode, which means we can give it dimensions and we can build things based on those dimensions and it just all fits nice, nicely in there. But if you were on mobile, obviously, certainly for portrait, this wouldn't be very good for mobile. So you uh, can either plan for, for portrait and make it a different aspect ratio or dimension there, or you can use the full mode, uh, which is what we often will do on mobile, where you get the full screen and then you have to handle the scaling. We have all sorts of things in Zim to handle that scaling and making that easy for you. Um, there's the background outer color. So that's why this is black here. If we change that to, uh, well, let's change it to interstellar like that and run it see what that looks like. I don't want to do too many changes. Um, didn't change. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, it's black. Oh, sorry. Interstellar. The, the first one is the color of the stage. And we have stuff over top of the stage. So the second one, inter, in, 
Interstellar is the outer color. My apologies. So this is the color of the stage. We don't see that changing. And I spelled Interstellar wrong, didn't I? Inter, Interstellar. Inter. There we go. And run that. Um, there we are. So now that backing color is the our Zim Interstellar color. You can do any HTML color you want, though. If you did the HTML red, you would put it in quotes like that. Oh, <laughs> missed the run. Hey, I just liked it. Oh, that got me every bit of red. So anyway, there's HTML color red. Here's the Zim color red. So if we save that and run it again, then it's... That's the Zim color red. It's almost like more of a tomato color. Uh, anyway, we want black here. And I can't, I think we just did black here too. Uh, not sure. Uh, we've made the pumpkin stuff or our background sort of cover that. So there we are back to ooh, our pumpkin y colors. Then we call ready. So this is the function to call when the frame is ready. We can also pass in parameters and we're using this Google font. So here's how you can bring in a Google font underscore and whatever the name of the Google font is. So shorten that down. We used to put the whole URL to the Google font there and I just thought it's easier this way. But you can also bring in pictures here and sound and JSON files and stuff. And if you have more than one asset, then you put them in an array. And the next parameter is the path. So where you find those assets. Uh, assets slash would be a relative path to your own assets folder. But uh, Google Fonts is, we don't need the, the, the path, so we're good there. All right, uh, there's more things you can do with the frame as well. And remember, you would see the docs if you wanted to see all of the parameters of the frame. Here's our function ready. Uh, if we wanted to, we could have used an arrow function in here, and some coders do. Oops, and drop that. Uh, sorry, I don't have my fingers going yet. And drop that down and done all of our code in there. But we, uh, Zim is so easy. I mean, it's very powerful for professionals, no problem. But Zim is very easy that kids might turn to Zim after Scratch, for instance. And so the arrow function for kids is a little bit, uh, I don't know, not quite as easy looking. So this one nicely spells out that the fact that it's a function. It can help them learn a little bit that way. So we simplified it by just putting ready there and then bringing us down into a function. Artists might like that too. <laughs> Are you an artist? Uh, so we're given some things in Zim. F for the frame, S for the stage, W for the width of the stage, and H for the height of the stage. And then this is where we would put our code here. So there's a code pen template. Uh, oh, maybe I should have stayed there. But there is a code pen template under pen. Oh, <laughs> you guys don't have it there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I have stored my code pen template in there, but you won't have it there. Uh, we'll go to the Zim, um, what's it called? The profile. So here's the Zim profile, codepen.io slash Zim.js. And coming down here, we have uh, this book app here, uh, which is a great way to see what's going on in Zim, uh, code that reads like a book. It's it's a, a book that's made with Zim, and in the book there are a whole bunch of interactive examples that we take you through. You can see the video for that. Uh, but this is the code pen template right here. We've just just created the latest code pen template, so uh, you can fork this. So um, well, maybe not there, but sure, add it to a collection of yours. But anyway, go into it and then fork it. Do you guys know where to find the forks? I think so. And then save that as a template, maybe you can do that. And here's that intro example that we made. There's the maze. Here's uh, another one in 3D, but this is making isometric games, uh, monsters, anyway. And you want to view all pens eventually to see all the pens. Sorry, the book doesn't look very exciting. Here's what it is. So there's Dr. Abstract. That's me. And now we're going to open this up. And uh, we can drag this around and we can sort of select things here. But anyway, you see that the page, there's an emitter. Isn't that nice? Okay, and there's that emitter still going there. Cool. So all sorts of examples of uh, what Zim can do, making puzzles 
and this is interactive in a book. Here we are dragging along a path, and the path is user editable. <laughs> like people, most most people don't have this kind of stuff. Beautiful pens. Oh, look at that. Okay, so Zim is very exciting. All of it's here on CodePen, but. Uh, we'd also like you to come out to the Zim site, zimjs.com, and really look around there and try some things out. So uh, that would be great. Uh, where were we? Back here and back into our pumpkin. Okay, so we're given F for the frame, S for the stage. Uh, the stage is this, and we put things on the stage. It, it's um, a metaphor. That has been used in back in director uh, director hey, go, get on the stage in the 90s possibly before you were born making cd-roms we had stages um, then flash came along and flash had a stage as well uh, they were both made by macromedia at the time then bought by adobe uh, flash has now become adobe animate because uh, of all the kerfuffles not getting on the iphone supposedly yet it actually got in the app store in the iphone with adobe air and worked just fine and uh, Millions of apps were made with, with Flash, but it uh, just got a bad name, and so that was a little bit hard for it. Canvas came along, was supposed to kill Flash, and really the Canvas just gave us the bitmap class in Flash. One, one class, that's what the Canvas gave us. The rest, we had to use JavaScript. We had to wrangle JavaScript, and it was awful. So um, people that used Flash made wonderful libraries. Uh, Grant Skinner and team made CreateJS. Create Pixie.js uh, was made as well, and uh, Pixie.js still going strong. Zim basically took over CreateJS, so we've taken CreateJS as a base and added so much more. So come in and uh, see what we've done there. All sorts of conveniences, components, and controls. But anyway, we have the width and the height of the stage, and coming on down, let's see what we've done. We've made some backing rings here. So we've made a container of those, a new container, given it the width and the height of the stage and added that to the stage. And the backing, I think we may have done that because we were going to cache our backing, but we ended up caching each ring because we're animating each ring. So we probably didn't even have to make a backing. Um, let's take that off. I don't think we had any other reason for the backing, so get rid of that. In other words, we're going to now loop 10 times, make a new circle each time, and center it. Um, oh, uh, did I shift the backing? Why are we centering it? And then we're moving it. Right, so how we started on this is we made a pumpkin. So the backing we decided to kind of add um, before. We made this pumpkin and put this pumpkin over here. And this is us just making these rings and moving them over there. Uh, probably shouldn't have hard-coded that because if we're making a pumpkin down below, we've got these hard-coded numbers here. We centered the pumpkin and moved the pumpkin to probably, where is the pumpkin? Let's have a look. Pumpkin, there it is. So, oh yeah, it had to do with, um, let's see, we centered the ridge. Nope, the pumpkin is, okay, so that's fine. And w what did we do? We centered it on the holder. The holder was moved over. All right, why did we put this the pumpkin in the holder in the first place? Ah, um, it says here. So a little bit of complexities there, nothing like starting off with complexities, is that we were wiggling the rotation of the pumpkin. So if you kind of look here, the pumpkin, oh, sorry, I rolled over the pumpkin and that's a different thing. But the pumpkin goes from side to side slowly. But we also wanted to roll over and rotate. So that's called rotation when it when we're animating it from side to side or wiggling it from side to side. Um, that's we're rotating it. And if we're rotating it to wiggle and rotating it when we spin, we can't. Uh, those rotations will conflict. So basically we put the pumpkin in a container and we either are rotating the container or wiggling the container, I'm not sure, and then doing the opposite on the actual pumpkin inside the container. Uh, but like I said, we have some notes for that and that's a bit of a complexity. Um, so let's uh, pop on back up and see our rings. I was, initially we had put the all these rings in a container. The rings we don't need to interact with them. Um, if you don't need to interact with something, you can turn it off with a no mouse, it's called. Uh, right here, here's a no mouse. Otherwise, we're assuming that you're interactive. And 
that's because we're making interactive media. So most of the things are interactive. And if, if you have a lot of something, I mean, there's not a lot of rings there, but uh, we may as well turn off the mouse on it so that we don't have to, so that CreateJS doesn't have to capture whether we're rolling over things or not. It just makes it more performant. We, we, it would work fine if we didn't. You want to see, comment that out, uh, save it and run it, and you'll get exactly the same performance. Uh, you won't be able to tell. Um, and yet, if you don't need it, we may as well uh, no mouse it. Caching is another thing that you can do if you're animating something. Um, usually you can't tell if it's cached or not. If you're not animating, you can actually see uh, a bit of dithering. If you cache, it's a, a little bit less quality, I suppose. But if you're animating something, such as these letters that are going past or the rings. I don't know if you noticed that, but our rings are getting a little bit bigger and smaller. It just creates an overall sort of mysterious effect. It's a, it's all visual. And these are things that you don't necessarily think of if you're making HTML. It's not the easiest thing to do to animate and wiggle in HTML. Uh, we know because it's six times the code, <laughs> basically. Zim, animate, and wiggle uh, are less code very easy. It's like GreenSock. GreenSock is great, or GSAP. Um, we're on par with GSAP in terms of animation in Zim. Okay, so um, where were we? We have cached it then, and that turns it into a bitmap, and it's used by the GPU rather than vectors. Otherwise, those are all vectors, and they're recalculated all the time as we animate them. And like I said, uh, no problem. But um, why not? Uh, why not be as efficient as you can? Uh, but you don't have to do that. Certainly, as you're building in Zim, there'll be many times until you become sort of pro at um, optimization and stuff like that. You don't even have to think about those things. Uh, but we put them in. Uh, we've moved them so that they've moved down to the corner here, and we sort of bypassed making of the circle because it looked a bit a little bit, little bit ugly. What we're doing there is we're making, we're looping, well, we bypass the loop too. This is a Zim loop. We loop 10 times. Each time we're given our index. The Zim loop can loop through a bunch of different things. It can loop through uh, arrays. It can loop through object literals. It can loop through containers. Um, and it can loop a number of times here. It can loop through HTML collections. Uh, so Zim loop is very versatile, easy to use. Okay, we're making a circle each time, and it looks like we're making it 900 to start in radius. So that's in radius. And we're subtracting roughly that much, and we played around with these numbers a little bit uh, times i. So the very first time, if i is 0, then we're going to have a radius of 900. And then here's a color, and we're changing, we're darkening this color. So this is a Zim color. We're darkening it by half plus whatever i is divided by 20. So, uh, yeah, just a little bit of playing. And what that does is it makes us dark to light rings. Well, actually, we're starting off in the light ring and, and building in. The reason why we start on the outside and build towards the middle is the outside circles are are bigger than the, the inside circles. So we want them in the back, and as we make each circle that we make, we're centering it and moving it or whatever, that means it's on top. Uh, you can get around that. If we wanted them all to be on the bottom, we could dot bot that. And then each one that we make would go to the bottom, and you would get something like this, which isn't very impressive. There you go. <laughs> because we just put all of the smaller ones on the bottom as we were making through, and basically the top one is the only one left. So that's sort of how we started, well, maybe with a bit of a darker orange on that. And we didn't, uh, we didn't really want it that way. <laughs> we wanted, we wanted um, it to look a bit more exciting. So we won't well, put all those on the bottom, or we could have reversed the loop. Reversing the loop you can do uh, right here, comma, true. That would reverse the loop, so I suppose 
I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know if you want to try it. I don't know if we, if we had. This is an explorer, after all, and explorers were supposed to explore things. But now we've reversed the loop, but putting them all on the bottom, and there it worked again. <laughs> okay. So isn't that easy? That's a, a Zim loop reverse. Rather than having to go like I minus minus, and, I, and, like, and swapping the whole for loop thing, uh, which is a pain in the neck. So anyway, Zim has a lot of these conveniences that you'll find both in using Canvas things like conveniences for CreateJS, which is what it's built on, but also conveniences in coding in general. And they're quite wonderful. Uh, and that's how we're getting to be shorter than other code is with a set of conveniences. Uh, if you are at all interested in coding, the API of coding and the UI UX of coding, then there is a UI UX banner on the front of Zim, and we go through the UI UX for the end user, like what we give the end user, the people using your apps, but we also go through the UI UX of, for the coder, and there's lots of features that Zim has that make coding a lot of fun. So we'd love it, to, uh, and yet it is JavaScript. I mean, it's, it's, we're still using JavaScript here. So anyway, here's our wiggle. Uh, we're wiggling the scale. And this is the starting uh, amount. <laughs> we realized a little bit too late um, that, wait a minute, usually we want to just start wiggling from whatever the property already is, like a scale of one, for instance. So we're on a default of a scale of one. Uh, so we could put one there. Actually, I don't know the scale of this. Oh, right, yeah, no, the, the scale is always one for these circles. So I could have just put one there, then maybe that's easier. That's a start scale. Here's how much we're wiggling. And with scale, you have to be a little bit careful. So with these, um, you see how they're not wiggling all that much? Like if we wiggled too much, like if you think, okay, a scale of one, right? it would just like absolutely crazy. Um, so one is the minimum and one's the maximum. And so, <laughs> I mean, do you like that? <laughs> Maybe you do. Right, I've got to remember that we just saved that live. So people who are coming in now to our pumpkin are going, What's going on? Uh, let's put that back again. Uh, point zero two. So scale is uh, one of the more sensitive things. Um, we're going to wiggle some rotation, and we can see that rotation make you know is a little bit easier to understand. Anyway, min and max of scale, and then this is uh, the minimum time. And this is the maximum time. So if we put little decimals in front of those, that would mean we're going to be wiggling a lot faster, shall we see? I saved it and run it. All right. And there's, whoa, fast wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. All right. And if you wanted it to wiggle all at the same time, then you could put 0.2.2. And I don't know what will happen. I mean, at this point, we may as well just wiggle the whole. Oh, yeah. So the wiggle sometimes goes in a different direction. Uh, but you can actually, there's a parameter that says make the wiggle always start to the one side or to the left side or the right side or the upside or the downside or something like that. Anyway. anyway, we don't want it all going at the same speed. And we also don't want it going that fast. So we're back to our slow, gentle wiggle in the back just to give it a bit of life without really realizing what's going on. I forgot, we were actually going to wiggle the shape of the pumpkin as well, uh, but maybe we don't need to. Like, uh, in theory, uh, we, no, not wiggle the, yeah, we didn't want to wiggle the shape of the pumpkin. We could, but we mm, wanted to change the shape of the pumpkin each time it changed color. That might have been a good idea. Like, perhaps rather than bouncing it, making it bigger and change color, we should have uh, moved it off screen, brought in a new pumpkin. Moved it off screen, brought in a new pumpkin. That might have made more sense because, like, why do pumpkins change color? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I guess people aren't going to really notice too much about that. But uh, we always look for relevance when we build things. By the way, this is called a Zim Explorer. Ooh. Yes. And when we do a Zim Explorer, we sometimes don't stick totally to the code. We look around, we test things, but Zim Explorers usually are done on existing code as opposed to other things in Zim. Zim Bubbling will show us new features, uh, but we have lots of things where we actually make code together, uh, various tutorials and stuff like that, but the Explorer is on existing code. 
and we do explore a little bit. So there we are, we're, we were exploring the idea of making the pumpkin change and you know we could actually go in. I'm not used to totally doing explores here on CodePen with a live with the live app. I mean, we could have forked this. Here's the fork down below here and played around with the fork. That might actually be a good idea. Why don't we just leave this one and I can delete the fork later. So here we are forking this one. And that will still show up on our on our Zim here, but uh, we have links to this from various social media and stuff, and those links will all go to the one that we're not playing around with. <laughs> so uh, now, yeah, now we can mess it up and not have to worry about it so much. All right, next, making the animation title. So this title right here is on a path. Uh, this won't look the best, but I may as well show it to you. So where is, there's a style, allow toggle show paths. So we can comment these guys out and run it. And like I said, it's it's not totally the nicest because we've taken our, our, our squiggle here and we've scaled it up 2.5 so that means it's a pretty fat looking squiggle usually we we don't scale it but uh, if we didn't scale it we couldn't get all these letters along it uh, there's an alternative to scaling though called transform points so if we went dot transform points and scale uh, I think we have to go we just pass in two parameters, scale uh, 2.5 here. So we can only transfer, transform one trans one object or one sorry property at a time. This one's we're going to do scale, and we don't do this one. Let's see what happens. So this should make the squiggle bigger, but not actually make it. So that's a natural size squiggle. All right, and not as thick, and there you go. So we've just scaled the the points, made all the points for the squiggle bigger rather than actually scaling the whole squiggle, including the points. <laughs> or sorry, including the controls and stuff like that, and that had made it really fat looking. But isn't that neat? So that's um, an editable path, which is called a Zim squiggle. We have squiggles and blobs. Actually, the pumpkin was made with blobs. We could take a look at that too. And um, then we put, letters along it. So let's see where we did that. The points for that actually looks pretty much like a plain squiggle, but no, maybe not. So the points we made out on a, another tool, do we sit, tell you where that tool is? I think we made the pumpkin when we made the pumpkin, which we did first. The points data was made here. So there's the URL, zimjs.com slash points. And yeah, we can go to that. Oh, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> There's no slash on the end. Oh, no, what is it? How do we get to points? Uh, that's weird. Okay, let's try it another way. So we have um, Pl Plasma Points is a new app that we made for the store. Oh, sorry, new app for the store. I got lots of points. Hey, I got lots of Plasma Points. So anyway, that's not what we want. So we have to fix that. Oh, and here's an ad for Plasma Points. Oh, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. So this is where we want it to go, this one. And where's this going? Paths, oh, sorry, I was talking points. So paths is where we went for that. And actually, this looks like it might've been the squiggle that we made specifically for that. Then we can get the code. So there's a bunch of different squiggles that you can go through and, and, yeah, and a bunch of blobs. So blobs are when it's a path that is completed or like comes around to its start again. So that's a blob. Uh, with blobs too, we usually do the fill color. That's actually the little stem of the pumpkin that I just made there. And we got the code for the little stem of the pumpkin, right? But basically you can uh, turn, you can use different um, handles as well. So this one is free. So they're free like that. They can go anyway. Oh, wait a minute. This is free too. What is the difference? <laughs> <laughs> when do we get a blue one? I don't know. Anyway, this one is when they're the same. Like that. So uh, mirrored, that one's called. If I double click, they become 
uh, straight. That one's called straight. If I double click, it's the, the one that we saw there. If I double click again, it takes it away. So I'm not even sure where, where that blue would get from. Uh, but anyway, I've just messed up our stem. Uh, but oh well, I don't think we need the stem anymore. Uh, and we can fill blobs. So blobs often are filled, uh, like that pumpkin that we saw. So that the blo the pumpkin itself is a blob. The little uh, brown top to the pumpkin. <laughs> Stop it, pumpkin! <laughs> Trying to show something. Keeps on rolling over. Um, but anyway, the pumpkin was also made there. I better change this, uh, and I don't want to change it here because this is the, the this is the copy of it. So we want to go back to here and change it here. Oopsie! I'm glad I found that out. And that was down below here. Not only that, but we mentioned how we made that down below. Where is our pumpkin? There it is. So this is paths, not points. And I might want to take this message and put it up above here too, since we moved this up above. And that was where, uh, here it is. The points data was made here. Okay, that's good enough. And that's back on the original. Uh, now we want to go to our copy. So here we are back on our copy. Anyway, that's where we made those points. So we just copied that stuff from the little points pop up there and stuck it under points for our squiggle. Uh, note, I suppose I can mention it here, although it's a little bit of an awkward one just because the points are so long. But we made a new squiggle. One of the parameters of squiggle is points. If we want to go directly to any parameter, we can use the squiggly brackets here. And then <laughs> the squig these squiggly brackets have nothing to do with the squiggle. But anyway, th that's an object literal in JavaScript. And we can put the name of the parameter followed by the value. We don't have to do it that way. Um, let's see that style. Looking for another example here. So uh, for instance, we could do the wiggle. If we wanted to do these as uh, what we call a configuration object, we take those normal parameters, we put them in the squiggly brackets, and this is the proper T. This one is the start, I can't remember the start value maybe, uh, all right, which, which we don't need anymore because uh, it's null, so we may as well use the default. This one was the min amount. This one is the max amount. This one is the min time. This one is the max time. And then if we wanted to, we could go to some other distant property or parameter. See, that's the nice thing about it. The order doesn't matter. I, I don't have to put ones that are null. So this is called the Zimduo technique, where we can do parameters in the regular order like we had before, or we can do parameters with their names. Uh, we were so proud of that. <laughs> we invented that 10 years ago. And then realized uh, one of our kids said, um, hey, that's what Python does. <laughs> what? <laughs> Apparently Python has a way to do parameters. You can just say the name of the parameter equals a value, or you can put them in order. There's is nice and uh, there, there's a very nice where you just say parameter equals this. Um, but anyway, uh, cool, huh? So this is the Zim Duo technique, and that's what allows us to have many, many parameters and not even care about it because you can pick and choose those. Um, uh, but if if you're like for Wiggle, <laughs> we wanted to use all the big, well, almost all the beginning ones. So I'm going to undo that and go back to here. We almost wanted to use all the basic ones, but we said that, you know, that one was the default one, but that was probably a scale of one anyway, as long as we haven't set a scale here. So yeah, I mean, we didn't really have that. We could have just ignored it completely, put null there. Um, but anyway, it comes in handy quite often. Okay, and that's one of these conveniences, UI, well, that would be a user experience convenience. Oh, it's a UX, a user interface as well. Okay, coming back up. That was us making our squiggle. And 
super and we are going to right here make a label on path usually this is pretty easy usually as you put the the, the uh, what words you want and the path <laughs> that's that's it but when we did that here's what it looked like I'll set this to null for now because of the Google font that we're using and I guess uh, maybe possibly because of how we did the path but anyway probably because of the font look at what happened to pumpkin it kind of gets munched there if your path was a little bit different pumpkin didn't get get munched but when you come in like that it can sometimes get munched um, also these things make a difference so it's possible no nah, I, I can't like how how close and far away by putting it far away it actually spreads the letters out a bit as opposed to close and it, it doesn't see how they spread and so these ones seemed a little bit more spready I can't grab that handle I'll have to pick up the whole thing here anyway maybe that handle is too long so anyway it just munched those a little bit uh, and and yet spread these out a bit, a bit too much so we can do custom kerning it's not often that we have to but sometimes depending on your path shape also the thickness of the font and stuff how many letters you have etc uh, if we had less letters it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as noticeable noticeable and where we go here that's the squiggle right so what we need to do is do some uh, we can it's, it's almost like kerning, uh, which means move letters left or right so that they look better in your font. Uh, we did it with this thing called percents. I think that was it. And let's run it now. And now they're spaced out more here. Okay. It took maybe five, ten minutes to do that. And what we did is you can uncomment this to see original without kerning okay fine we did that already uncomment this to start okay so if we zog title so the title is our label on path and we obviously we don't want to do that anymore so these are the original percents so I'm going to ask for the original percents to string and what that does is it gives me this In the console f12 there they are right there so those are the original percents of the letters and then what you can do is you can shift them about so i can make this 14 make that 18 etc but it's a little bit tricky to shift all of them you know what i mean um Maybe we could make a tool or something. So here's us just thinking about what might be done. Could make a tool that allows you to slide the letters along the path and then record the percents. That might be nice. We don't we don't have that at the moment. But this is our thinking. Whenever whenever something wasn't easy, like we haven't I hadn't had to work with um, the percents all that much. I once or twice, but this was the worst case. Of, of working with the percents and then so coming in here there they there are the originals and uh it looks like we did some we we broke them down into words those are the spacings on the word what then we had a space here are the spacings on the word color then we had a space then because each space is also considered um, a percent moving it over there's the is the the and finally the pumpkin with the exclamation mark okay then we thought that we could just shift them all a little bit by a certain amount. And you can see that we do have a lot of them shifted with the letter A. That's a problem. If you shift some of these early on, we want the rest of them to shift. But I don't want to like change every number specifically. So we, we set up a variable as how much we were shifting initially. So if we say that that, that is a 6 or something, then we're going to get a slightly... Uh, all of these will shift closer on the left-hand side here we got a okay that's that oh yeah so they're all fatter somewhere and this is now munched a little bit so maybe we'd have to go the other one, uh, one does let's have a look i'm not sure they're still slightly munched 
anyway, not a very good demonstration. But where were we? We were at four, and so we tried that for a bit, and then we ended up having to go in and doing some man. Here was the original one. We we subtracted a slight different amount. You see, we're going 4.5, 3.3, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, and then no shift. So that we had to sort of proportionally shift the last letter. Obviously, that's a little bit of a pain in the neck to do. It does give us exactly what we want, though, um, like pixel perfect shifting. But <laughs> was that was that good? It doesn't look great. Uh, was it actually four? What happened to my? Oh, I maybe didn't bring back in percents, so that that could have been it. Uh, let's try it now. Which means that's why the shifting wasn't doing it, doing what I was expecting. Okay, so now that we brought back the percents, uh, let's try that shift again. What's <laughs> it doing? Six. Okay, we'll run it. Well, that's good because I was going. Oh, that didn't seem to make much difference. Um, so now we're shifting these ones six rather than four like back six and so you can see that this one what color is is bumping together it's leaving more room up to the pumpkin which means we could increase these sizes and make the pumpkin spread so it basically that number moves all of these guys to the left so that we can have more room for the word pumpkin if we only had a one there then these guys would be spaced out more and we wouldn't have much room for the pumpkin so now these guys are quite spaced out and the pumpkin is uh, crunched by the the. Our pumpkin still looks good, but the the is too close to the pumpkin. So we want to move, and it, what is fine, but we just want to move the color is the, color is the, move on all that back. And that's where the A's start. The A's aren't in the what, the A's are only after. Anyway, <laughs> who the <heck> cares? <laughs> there, Zim Explorer cares, all right, woohoo. Um, anyway, uh, that's probably enough on putting the letters on a path, wouldn't you say? So that's letters on a path. We're centering the registration of that and positioning it somewhere. And then we're wiggling the scale, changing the alpha to zero and animating that in. So let's see what that's about. But first, a little bit about centering the reg. Why did we do that? Because we are wiggling the scale. So if we didn't center the registration point. Uh, not much would change initially here. It would look basically the same as it comes in, but look at the wiggle. It's basically wiggling about the top left corner now. So the left hand side is staying and the right hand side is sort of swinging around because we're changing the scale based on the top left corner of this thing. Okay, and then it wiggles at different speeds and different amounts. So sometimes it's easier to see than others. But anyway, that's not what we want. We don't want it doing that. We want it wiggling about the middle. So that's us centering what is called a registration point. We may be able to see, let's try a dot outline on that. Out, I can spell it. Outline. And we save that and refresh here, run. The outline is a snapshot in time, and so it, it's not going to wiggle, but it, just when it was made, this is what it looked like when it first started. And you can see that the registration point is in the middle there, and that means it will scale from the middle. So this round thing is the registration point. Ooh, okay. And that would be good for spinning too. And similar things for each letter that we wiggle, we might want to consider how in the pumpkin. When we did the pump, uh, stop it. <laughs> it rolled over the pumpkin. When we did the pumpkin, we wanted it to scale. We wanted it to scale from the bottom and get bigger going up rather than scaling from the middle. You see how it sort of bounces on the ground like that? A bounce doesn't look the best when it bounces about the middle. An elastic, that's the ease where we got on there. An elastic ease works better when it's in the middle. An elastic, it goes wow, wow, wow. Back out in will work nicely from the middle, but a bounce really should bounce from the bottom. And so that's why we put the registration point of the pumpkin at the bottom. Um, but anyway, we haven't seen that yet. That's just a little bit of a talk about registration point. Okay, what else did we see here? We have we're wiggling the scale okay we talked about that i think already or something similar we're setting the alpha to zero we are waiting 
So this is Zim animate right here, which actually means if we wanted to, we could have used set colon alpha colon zero. So comma and not set the alpha, but I don't know, this is shorter. So I like that better. So this is short chainable. We can set, uh, we could set an alpha property of label on path, that would be like title dot alpha equals zero. We can set rotation, title dot rotation equals 20. We can set X and Y, title dot X equals 70. Um, but we often chain. So this is our chaining. Here we are, we could set the registration, title dot reg X equals. And often when we do this, that means we don't even need to put it in a variable. We just say, hey, do all this stuff to the label on path and we're chaining. Each of these is on the end of the object. It turns out that we, I think we're gonna need the title later. I'm not sure if we don't need the title later. Yeah, uh, here we are looping through all the letters in the title. So uh, we needed that later. Anyway, these are short, uh, these are short chainables right here. And there's also rote for rotation. It's not rot, <laughs> it's rote. Uh, there's ska for scale. Aren't those neat? So those are short little chainables. So there we're chaining on the alpha. We're saying basically start with alpha zero. Um, we could have done it with a set there, but like I said, that's actually longer than just chaining it to alpha zero to start. But here we are animating. We're going to wait 0.5 seconds. We're animating the props to one, so or the alpha to one in a time of two. Okay, so this is animation, not wiggling. Uh, and Zim is very powerful that way. That's using the configuration object. You see that? How we've got different properties of the animate done. And the reason why we use the configuration object there is we wanted to wait. The wait parameter is other, otherwise we could have just said alpha zero, two. Okay, so look at that. Animate alpha to, to one in two seconds, because those are the first two parameters. But the weight parameter is after a whole bunch of other stuff. We've got the type of ease, we've got the callback function, um, the time, and I don't know, I think weight is beyond that. You'd have to look at the docs. So remember how to do that? You go to Zim, you hit docs, you type in animate here. And oh, actually, the yeah, wait's not too far away. It's just after, so there's a callback function that we don't need, and there's the parameters for the callback function that we don't need, and then there's the wait. So we would have had to go the props, the time, and we didn't even need to change the ease. We would have had to go props, times, null, 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 and then the wait time. So instead of doing those three nulls, we just threw them into the object literal right away. Um, you would almost always go into the object literal or the configuration object if you want to loop because look where loop is, especially if you want to rewind because here's rewind. Uh, okay, so um, if you're wanting to rewind, there's no way you're going null, 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 null. All right, at that point, you'd have to go configuration object. Okay, so let's undo this though. Okay. Style, a style of nothing. Where do we set a style previously? Ah, right, we didn't really talk about style here. So style, right, and then that's why we're getting this uh, path showing up here as well. Zim's got style on the canvas, and that's pretty amazing. So I don't think any other canvas framework has style, primarily because they don't really work with components all that much. Style really helps with components, it helps with other things too though. Because uh, they other canvas frameworks get lazy and they just say, oh, use HTML components. Well, God, HTML components haven't changed in years since the 90s. Most of them, oh, okay, in HTML5, they added like a slider, a color picker, a date picker. Okay, so they added maybe four components. And now they've got, oh, they've got like 10 components now. Yay. Uh, Zim's got something like 40 components, maybe more. And they're all customizable and different, exciting. And so sort of like, Ah, you know, like, um, so we, and integrate it. Not only that, uh, other Canvas things are saying, all oh, right, you got some HTML, just use those components. Well, they're not, they're not integrated. They're not in the same place as the Canvas. They're always outside or up on the top or, you know, whatever. So our components are integrated and we're not looking at a component here. Uh, well, actually that's a button and this thing's a selector. But you see that if you had HTML here, 
then you have problems interacting with things around and underneath because you can only interact with one thing or the other, HTML or the canvas. Um, they start conflicting otherwise. And these are all integrated, uh, in, embedded in what we're working with, et cetera, much nicer. It is absolutely ridiculous to work with two different systems for an app. I, really, you do not want to. Um, I know, <laughs> been doing this for years. Remember all the way back through to the early 90s, there's another thing that makes uh, Zim much easier is custom components uh, that you can use right in, on the, right in the canvas. All right, so anyway, we're styling those. Um, but that's another thing. Uh, you can't use CSS on the canvas. You can use it on the outside of the canvas, like the main canvas tag. It could change itself or its dimensions with CSS. But on the inside here, all this stuff that you're seeing, these are dynamically drawn on the canvas. CSS cannot access these. So we can, though. With style, it's very much like CSS. We're setting a color of orange, uh, a size of 60, a font, and we're also setting the allow toggle and stuff. So these styles will get applied to whatever is made after them. Uh, here, we also did not, uh, you can do all the stuff that CSS can do. You can say, oh, make this work on a label on path. Uh, we'll get these styles. So this is any label on paths will get these styles. I'm not sure if uh, I think all those are being applied to label on path. But you don't have to. If you, if, you, if you did this, only these would be applied to the label on paths. But uh, if you don't do that, then these things get applied to anything that has those parameters. Um, there's also groups that you can do. So groups are like classes, but we didn't call them classes. Classes in CSS because we already are working in classes in code. And so we didn't want to confuse the thing. So we call them groups, uh, which means you can assign a group to anything like this, this button right here. Uh, this button could be part of a group. Um, this is actually the same button as that. That's a toggle on the button. Uh, going from pause to pause. Oh, gosh, look at my score. Die! Oopsies. I don't think I'm going to come back from that score. Um, anyway, uh, we could as assign a group to this button and some other button and then apply styles only to the group. And there's other features as well to Zim style, which is exciting. But anyway, there's the style, and we're basically applying that style to the label on the path or whatever's next, because there we are turning off the style. So it's done a little bit differently, where you um, anything that gets made after you set the style will, will have that style. When you want to change that, you turn it off. And there's other ways that you could do that. We also can work on the style class as a, um, a static class, so style.clear would do that. And then you've got things like you can remember. So you instead of clearing, you could remember these styles and then uh, bring them back for later. Um, and that allows you to change styles up as you go. But we don't have to do that all that often. You'll find that the system of st setting some styles, building some stuff, setting some different styles, building some stuff works quite well. It's actually almost easier to get your head around um, doing it that way. All right, so we've set some styles, but we just turned the styles off, and that means that nothing, the stuff that we're building next won't get those styles. Um, and we don't need this anymore. Oop, that was to figure out the, per the percents. And here we are caching and wiggling the scale of each letter. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to take each letter that we've made and loop through them. So each letter, and when we do, we get a label. That's probably not the best. Uh, call it a letter. May as well call it a letter, and a letter here, probably. Oh, I'm changing the, the fork. Uh, well, that's maybe not that important. Uh, each letter is actually a label. OK, so a label is how we make text in Zim. and each letter so when we loop through letters we're getting each letter or or we were i had label from before but anyway we're getting each letter we're caching it you don't have to uh if you cache the letter it depends on the font but uh if we don't cache with a bit of margin there here's what happens i think they get all chopped off at the top yeah 
So you see how the tops of them there? Caching puts a rectangle around the, the, the bounds of it. And this font, like fonts uh, sort of notoriously are all slightly different and don't stay within the, the, like the average text bounds sort of thing. No problem, really. Um, but anyway, it's chopped off the top of them. So therefore, we've gone right to the uh, margin parameter by putting in the squiggly brackets. I can't remember. There's also, you could have put in custom X, Y with height there for cache, but we don't want that. We just want to, and scale is another one. Um, but we uh, want to go directly to the margin and that just adds 10 pixels around it. No big deal. All right, and then we're wiggling at scale. Scale again, come on, I want to wiggle something else. Uh, but anyway, we're wiggling the scale of the letters and that's what's causing them to, to go up and down. So run this again. And again, the cache is optional. I don't know if you can tell, let's, let's take off the cache. So here's no cache, it will wiggle just fine. Um, but, and possibly be a little bit crisper looking but it does take yeah it's a little bit crisper looking but it does take up processing and sometimes on mobile if you're animating text it can kind of look a bit steppy but if you turn it in if you cache it it doesn't um, and because it's moving you can't really tell how crisp it is or not it doesn't matter it's almost like a motion blur Woo! <laughs> it's not even that you know it's 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 just a slay like, yeah. could you tell the difference i don't know probably not okay this is also a video recording that we're doing. This video recording, by the way, has been an hour. If you guys are still here, that's pretty amazing. You might want to stretch, get a cookie, get a drink. I might want to stretch, get a cookie, get a drink. I'm going to keep on going. I didn't really intend it to be an hour, but it looks like there's all uh, sorts of little tricks that we're talking about here. So hopefully you're fine with that and relaxing and enjoying this. Probably just want me to get on and stop talking. But okay, so now let's get on with it then. Um, so there it is back to cached. Did we run it? I can't remember. Let's do a point where I, I know I've saved that. Uh, I really can't quite tell. And that will give better performance and be smoother in animating. So usually when I'm animating text, I'll cache the text. And there's our wiggle, fine. So we looped through, did every letter, is wiggling at scale a little bit. And we're animating the path, so the letters wiggle. Okay, so the if we didn't, let's reduce some of the other wiggling here. What would that be? Uh, that would be back on the, oh no, those are the circles. Where else did we wiggle? I thought we wiggled the scale of the title here. Yeah, so let's reduce the, or take off the wiggle of the, of the scale. Why don't we bring back the that's the pumpkin we'll bring back the styles that we comment or close there take away those so that we see the path run oh we didn't really talk about that that's actually targeting uh, allow toggle will mean that we can turn on and off the path by clicking on the letters or not that's toggle show path is whether it's showing the path at the beginning so there's the path and you can see that uh, we're not animating the scale anymore, but what we're animating is these points right here on the end. We're animating the rotation of the points, and that makes the whole path go up and down. The letters are popping up and down as well. Maybe we'll just take off the animation of the letters so you can see that a bit better. And that was when we looped through. Comment that out. Why don't we wiggle? So we're wiggling the rotation from its starting rotation which is probably zero anyway, we're wiggling at least three degrees to five degrees. The other one, the one on the right, so we wiggled this one left. This is the first point here. So the paths, point controls. So the point controls are these little points and uh, right. Um, yeah. That should be point circles, maybe. If the point controls hold all of it, so maybe that's the container, yeah. So we're just rotating the container that has this, has the little circle there. And that's uh, on a squiggle, that's how you can access the points in there. There's the first one is over here, second one is, is here. And it looks like we've just decided to rotate that one a little bit uh, less right here, three to five degrees. 
and this is 5 to 10 degrees. Shall we wiggle even more, like 15 to 20 or something? And let's have a look and see what's uh, what this does. It's probably going to... Whoa! Whoa! Okay, so there we are wiggling that more. Not too bad, but we don't really need to wiggle all that much. Isn't that neat? Should we do it faster? 0.2. So here, 0.2 to... Uh, well, I'll go 0.2 to 0.5, whatever. That's practically for... We're not going to be able to notice because this is just going to be fast. Well, ah, okay. Oops, something awkward is going on. What's what's going on with this? <laughs> oompa, oompa, oompa. Uh, I don't know what's on my mind. Anyway, run, go, pumpkin. <laughs> We're pumpkin, pumpkining. Uh, there it is. Back to the wiggle on it. It's just a little bit subtle and a little bit different. Okay. You know, we don't do that a lot in HTML because that kind of stuff is not easy to do. And, oh, right. If we didn't do this, we won't see any change. So now we are doing that. And, oh, somehow we do see change. Interesting. The path isn't updating. Oh, so I don't think we even need to do that. The path itself, look at the little... Uh, certain things are moving, but that's because we haven't updated the squiggle. So if you ever change the points of a squiggle, normally when you drag a squiggle around, we're, we're actually manually changing it by dragging the little boxes and circles and stuff, which I guess we can still do. Um, when we move them like that, if, if we programmatically do it, we have to update it. So that's what this is doing. It's updating the, all of the little yeah that's right so the the effect of the path is is happening but what it looks like isn't updated unless we manually update that so we bring that back and now the path is manually updating okay whoa there we've crunched it there we've crunched it or not crunched it opened it up again that's pretty cool huh Anyway, that uh, needs to update the path. If as soon as we do this kind of stuff, we need to update the path. Wiggles can be used for uh, or paths and stuff. I'm going to go to Zim here and go to examples. There's all sorts of examples in Zim. How the examples work? These are sort of the latest things that we've been adding to Zim. Uh, although that's the editor and that's the intro, but otherwise these are sort of latest things. And then it kind of blends down into a mix of more full things like, I don't know, Gen Pen and Alone Droid. That's a full game. There's Alone Droid 1. But anyway, I wanted to show you this one. This is a light show. Oh, this is animating to sound. Great. But um, there's Wiggles. So that's, that's a blob that we're wiggling and we're making those shapes. This circle is being animated to sound frequencies. And this was all projected onto a band. So the circle, actually maybe circles, I can't remember if it has multiples. But anyway, we're animating to live music as we projected this onto them. Okay, so this is a sound house. Okay, so uh, that was an example. We have all sorts of examples of wiggling blobs as well to make cool shape things happen. And we have a pumpkin. We have not even gotten into the game. Oh God, I think we may need a part two on this. Uh -huh. Okay, so the pumpkin. Right, we had mentioned that problem with the pumpkin in that we're both rolling over and rotating and wiggling the rotation, and those two rotations would conflict. So that's why we put it in a holder. It only took two minutes to, to build this. We made a holder. We center reg the holder so that when we do rotate, I think this must be the rotation that we're doing, it's rotating around the center. And uh, there we are making a pumpkin. Um, and then we're going to wiggle the rotation of this pumpkin container, and we're going to uh, roll over the rotation of the holder. So the holder right down here holder dot on mouse over if spinning we're not going to bother to spin so we don't, we don't want to keep on rolling like have it roll too many times or interrupt its roll so we've set spinning to true we're then animating another way to do that uh, yeah we've been a bit tricky we could give this animate an id 
and then find out if that ID is animating, but it's probably just as easy to set our own variable there. Do you see what we're doing? We're not spinning, but when we mouse over it, if we're not spinning, or sorry, if we are spinning, return, don't, don't continue to spin, but we're not spinning. So great, when we come in and roll over in the first time, we're gonna spin, and then uh, we set spinning to true. So the next time we roll over, if it's already spinning, it's spinning, it's gonna return and not do the rest of it. Then once we're finished animating, we have a callback, a call. When we're finished animating, we're gonna set the rotation to zero and um, set the spinning back to false. Okay, uh, we set this rotation to zero because we rotate it to 720 each time. And that's a hard-coded 720, which means if it's already rotated to 720, watch what happens. So I comment this out, and we save it and run it. I rotate, looks great, but now I roll over it again. Oh, it didn't, because did, it's already at 720, so it's trying to rotate to 720, and <laughs> it's already there. Uh, the way to do that possibly would be to go quote, quote 720. What that is, is it's a relative amount. So it'll go 720 degrees from wherever it is. So I save that up and run it. So that's relative animation. And there it goes 720 degrees more and another 100, 720 and another 720. It's just, now it's sitting at like thousands rotation. It's a, at a rotation of thousands and I just it didn't want to wind it up forever. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad for it. So, I mean, uh, alternatively, just when I'm done here, I can just set it back to zero. So this means when I'm finished rotating, don't stay at 720, set it back to zero. And that, that's fine, too. So that's the way I did it rather than relative animation. <laughs> just just so I don't wind it up so much. And that also works. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, a bit of finagling that we don't usually run into when we... Uh, you know, when we're doing things, I, I was wanting to animate or change the same property in two different times or different ways, so that that was the conflict. Uh, but anyway, coming on down, try not to worry too much about that. We are making a pumpkin, so there's the body of the pumpkin, and I drew that out at the the, the points or the path paths. Yep, uh, zimjs.com/paths. And then just pasted the points in there. I made the color orange, made it not interactive. So normally it is interactive, which means this wouldn't be here. You could set interactive true. And uh, then your pumpkin is interactive. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> and spinning. Uh, so yeah, not very helpfully interactive. Let's um, fix that a bit. We can set it to true here, I think, and that means it won't bother doing the rollover or we could have commented all that code out. All right, so there it is, and now I can pick that up, or should, should have, okay, it must be in a, a no mouse. Oh, interesting. So it's actually dragging, it's, it's cached, okay. So we've cached the pumpkin, so we don't wanna cache it. Let me find out where that is. Pumpkin.cache. <laughs> all right oh there we are okay so that's us playing around it's a little bit awkward because it's all animating but there's us playing around with the pumpkin and the idea was we were actually going to make uh, or uh, an not animate it but just uh swap these so one one time the pumpkin's going to be like that we're also when we do that we're bringing it up to the top and therefore these parts are in behind there is, if we wanted to, when we make the pumpkin, new blob, that's the edges, here's the body. We could have said on top, colon false, like that, and uh, then run it again. See, isn't this wonderful? We have so many things. We've been building interactive media since the 90s. We know what the problems are. It's basically been the same. Director, flash, and the canvas. This is interactive media. Same tricks, same type of things to make this magic. And we know we've had, we've had thousands, if not millions of logical people all working on this. And we know what needs to be done to make this uh, doable. So now we've, we're not 
dragging on top anymore. And so we were planning on making different size pumpkins or different shaped pumpkins. Would you like that? And the next pumpkin would look like that. And then we'd get a pumpkin um, that, <laughs> well, oh, by the way, you can add shapes to or add points. So now we've added another point and we have, a, you know, there we go. We can basically make any pumpkin we want. <laughs> and so we could have uh, kind of randomly set those so that they, they do things like that. Oops. Uh, we put them in ranges, and we could have had a different punch, pumpkin each time. That would have actually looked pretty cool, huh? I think that would have been neat. Anyway, interactive false will make it so that we can't interact with that, and then the on top doesn't really matter. Oh, whatever. This, I'm going to delete this afterwards. So here's the edges. So these little edges were also done. Um, they're orange. We darkened them. There's the second edge. We rotated that all around. Did we clone it? Yeah, we cloned it. So we didn't even bother making the points. We have a clone that we can do. So we just cloned the same blob and then rotated it. Maybe change some of the scales on it. We made the stem. The stem, you saw that we had drawn the stem earlier. We placed that. So all these are being placed in the pumpkin container and that's why they all animate together. It's important to have a container like that. That is something that the canvas didn't have. Raw canvas. No container. Uh, CreateJS came along and said, oh, you guys, we need containers. And we also need to know when we're pressing on these containers. So that's primarily what CreateJS gave us on the canvas was containers and the events to know when we're pressing on things. Um, and then from that, Zim, uh, like, so you'd have to do your own custom drag to say, oh, I've moused down on this part. And now my cursor is here, so I want to move that part to where my cursor is, less where we started pressing on it. And then when we mouse up, we want to remove all that stuff. Um, so that's that was CreateJS. Zim came along and said dot drag and, and turned that into a convenience, just one line, dot drag. And the dot drag also gives us other things. We can throw it. Um, so that wasn't built in. We can have bounds on it. That wasn't built in. So all these other conveniences, bringing things up on top automatically um, or not. Uh, do we want to drag the whole container? Or do we want to drag the parts of the container? So all these things are built into drag as well. Um, all right. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Looks like we cached the pumpkin just to give it better performance. And in this case, we're scaling the pumpkin up. So you see how it starts off at a certain size. If we didn't cache with a scale, I don't know, we might not be able to tell, but I thought I could for a little bit. So here it is. Watch the edges of it here. As it gets bigger, we could have slowed it. And yeah, let's slow that down a bit. There's the time right there. Let's go 5.5 seconds and run it. Now nah, that's on the animation of the alpha. <laughs> okay. Uh, animation of the scale, 5.5 seconds. Okay, here we go. And so, whoa, okay. Yeah. It's got quite the elastic, or no, the bounce on it, so. It's still, but yeah, once it bounces, I saw it there. Uh, it's, uh, it's an elastic out on the scale of it. And then pumpkin, that's the pumpkin cache and pumpkin dot anime. Oh, that's the initial elastic in. So that's why the, this is only on the in. So when we bring the pumpkin in for the first time, there, you see how slowly that came in? That was the 5.5, so I did the wrong one. Uh, we're waiting, pumpkin animating time, there it is. Okay, so we'll animate that. We can comment out the ease too, and we don't have to put up with the bouncing. Anytime you animate with a bounce or an elastic, it, um, it, uh, you need more time. So there we're getting it bigger, and you see all the little chunkies around that? And chunkies at the bottom. So that's because we're animating instead of vectors, instead of keeping a vector where that will grow and be very smooth, as smooth as it can be. Oh uh, yeah, I see them in here in the little points as well. The, um, we cached it and we cached it at the original size. And then as we're animating, and that's just like animating a picture basically. And so you start seeing a bit of blur around the edges. So instead we, bop, 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 cached it so that it actually had a scale of 1.5. And when we do that, let's bring this back to 5 here and commenting up the bounce, we should see less chunkies. You, you run into a problem, though, because if you 
1.5 means it's already scaled down and now we're scaling it up and I see less, yes, definitely less um, problems around the edge. So that's great. Uh, or if we didn't cache it at all, also we would see it would be very smooth. But anyway, that that's increasing the scale of our cache, which is like making the picture a bit bigger so that when we animate it bigger, it, um, it still looks nice, okay? And that's no problem. We're not like wasting download or anything like that. Uh, we are animating itself and scale up. Okay, so that's animation on the on the pumpkin. Like we don't need to go through all that stuff. There's loops and rewind weights and stuff like that. There's also a rewind call, which is actually when we're changing the color of the body. So let's have a look at that. We don't need to go through the animation, so you should be able to figure out what's going on there. Um, although we are animating to a min and a max. You see this thing right there? That's called a zim v value. It's a min and a max value in this case, but it could be uh, like what we're using. Well, okay. Uh, it could be uh, random. So if we put in square brackets here and went 1.2 comma 1.5, that would be either random, either go to a scale of 1.2 or 1.5 randomly. So that's, for instance, if we were going to tile a circle, rather than tiling it and being red, like, hey, here's 20, uh, here's a tile of 20 red circles, we could tile square brackets red, blue, and then it would be randomly red or blue circles that we're tiling. Or we could pa pass in a series, because if we just randomly, they might be like two red ones, three blue ones, one blue one, one red one, three red ones, five red ones. Oops, five blue ones. Uh, okay, you know, that, that would be random. But if we wanted a series, then we can pass in a series of colors, and then it would go red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, or we could go series every two, and then it would go red, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, or we could do a mix, which would randomize it, and then the next series, randomize it again, next series, randomize it again, and yet they would never be next to one another. Well, red and blue randomized would be ridiculous, but... Um, Anyway, there's all sorts of options that we can do. Those are called ZIMV values, and they're dynamic parameters. If we are emitting particles, we can emit different particles with ZIMV values. And it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing convenience that Zim has that nobody else has. Um, that really cuts down on size, makes things possible that aren't possible otherwise. And it's just been wonderful. And we can style with those as well. So nth child, oh, nth child is crap compared to this. Like, uh, um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So where'd we get to then? Uh, right, I was going to bypass that and <laughs> coming down to the call here. We're changing the color based on one of these colors uh, that come from here. So this is a series. So I'm going up, let's find out where we have the series of the colors. I think we might have used them. Did we use them right at the beginning? Sorry, guess not. Uh, find colors. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right where we were. So we're, oh, there they are. Uh, okay, we're using this when we finish animating, um, which is later. We define them or declared them down here. Const colors is a series, so uh, it looks a little bit awkward normally. <laughs> normally it would be a, a series of red, green, uh, whatever, purple. Okay, and that's it. Nice and simple. But in this case, it's a series of different oranges. Uh, probably could have done this pro programmatically somehow. But anyway, orange, orange that's slightly darker and darker. Orange that's a bit towards red, purple, red, green. So do you see what we've done? Um, these are Zim methods that we that get added to color. Uh, HTML color as well. Pound sign, 3344 four, AA or whatever. Okay, so actually we've extended a string to add these methods to the string so that we can get these colors as well. Um, it's very handy to be able to do that. There's also a two alpha. So not only they're darken, but there's a two alpha as well, which means we can turn any color easily uh, into something that has transparencies. 
Um, anyway, those are the set of colors that we've changed to. We put it in a series, and then whenever we want, uh, by calling that, it will call the next one in the series. But take a look closely at the series. Like that, that would be that would be bad because our pumpkin would be constantly changing in the same order. And maybe somebody could catch that order. And when they actually go to play the game, they could say, oh, I know it's going to be this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. As a matter of fact, if, if it were a series, it would be dead easy. Because these would also be, like these are being drawn from the same series. Let's take a look at that. That is called our selector. So where is our selector? That's a play button. There's our selector right there. Choices. So, oh, choices is the tile, and the tile is made up of the colors. Okay, so when we make a tile, we're tiling a new circle of 20. So that's these circles that we're seeing here. And we're getting it from the colors. So that's the ZimV value accepting um, a series as a value. Therefore, uh, it does them in order. Here's the, 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 the trick is why I'm saying this is working is actually because we've got mix. So initially, um, initially we made, actually that's kind of interesting. I think the very first time it might actually be, no, it's going to, yeah, it might animate through, <laughs> I can't remember, it. it might actually animate in order. I don't think it does, but uh, because Mix scrambles it. So it takes this series and scrambles it, but you have to go through the series. Um, yeah, okay, we're fine. So here's the series right here being made. The next thing we do is we make the tile from that mix. As soon as, because we make each one. Like, so these are actually the colors. That's orange, orange darken, orange, well, actually it could be random um, because mix randomizes it the first time. So it randomizes it once, makes this, and then once it's finished, it randomizes it again. So now it's being, it's finished, so it's randomizing it again, and it's being called by wherever up above every time we animate right here. So this is calling the series, which goes to the next thing in the series. So we're good. It randomized it, then it re-randomized it, and every time it finishes that order, it randomizes it again. So um, nice. That means you don't get duplicates. That means you don't get the same color twice. Isn't that nice? And here's what it would look like, by the way, if we didn't put mix off, then, or, or we didn't mix it, then these would be in the order that we've listed them here. These are, I guess this is orange, then orange.darken. I don't know, does that look like orange and orange.darken? Hard to say. <laughs> oh yeah, orange, slightly darker, slightly darker. Then a red one. Then this is the purple. Then another red one with, that's more towards the red. You see how that's 0.5 towards the red? This one is towards a green. This one's another towards red just a little bit. And this one's towards a little bit of yellow. Okay, which means these are actually also cycling through in the same order. That's the brown. So this should be quite easy. I should just pick this one next. Oh, <laughs> God. it's slowed down though. I left the two point. Or, oh, there. Yeah, that one's right. Okay, so we're, we're now just going through the series. We built this in a series, and the pumpkin's changing colors in the series, but no mix. So the next one's going to be here. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. It's there. All right, so I could win this game quite easily. and I, Plus, I get all sorts of extra time. I'm building up my score while I wait for this pumpkin to change. <laughs> That's the next one. Yeah, so if you want to defeat this game, then there's how to do it. Anyway, we've got mix here, dot mix. And there's a bunch of other ones as well. Um, and you can look up in the docs under series to find those. And why don't we increase the time or decrease the time? I think it was 1.2 seconds and we'd be back to normal. We're rewinding that, we're looping it, we're waiting on the loop. So as it loops, it waits. Where is that? That's down at the bottom. So once it's finished looping, it's waiting. That's why it's waiting down in there in the bottom. And then it goes and rewinds again. And then as we're rewinding, it gets a rewind call. We're changing the color and we're updating the cache because we had cached the pumpkin.
right up here. So anytime, if you didn't update the cache, we wouldn't see the change because cache keeps that image around. Um, so we should see it faster now again, which is good. So play. Uh, it's not all that much faster. I must have missed something somewhere. Time, pumpkin, animate. Oh, man. I, oh, I didn't miss anything. Do you know what it is? That is the normal ease. So that's a normal ease. We took, I, I did miss, we had a bounce in. And so that time is too long for a normal ease. You see how that's a boring animation. I'm getting bigger. I'm getting smaller. So wait around for a bit. I'm getting bigger. I'm getting smaller. Okay, that's way too long. If you wanted a normal ease, well, let's see what we would do there. If you wanted a normal ease, you'd be like talking point, uh, 0.7, maybe 0.5. Okay, let's try this. Uh, probably even 0.5. Don't sit around waiting for your, your animations to happen. Okay, I don't know, even that one was kind of slow, wasn't it? I wonder why. Time point three. We've got to wait, we've got to bounce. Could have in decreased my weight. Boop, okay, that's nice for, for that amount. Anyway, that's not what we want. Oh, I've also got, I'm only picking two scales here. I forgot I changed that. So it's, it's going from a scale to 1.2 or, or 1.5. Uh, and we wanted a bounce in. And for the bounce in, you also don't go something like 0.5 for a bounce in. That would look really bad. So let's see what that goes. Oh, also, let's uh, increase the scale to you know, two here. And so we can see that a bit better. You ready? Here we go. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, isn't that bad? Like, look how fa fast those bounces are going. <laughs> So no, you need a longer time. And uh, so here's what a 1.5 bounce, where we can actually have some time to see it do its bounce. Remember, the first time is the elastic. That's a different ease altogether. Whee! OK, nice. And you don't have to have the bounce in. You could just bounce out. Oh, oh sorry, we are rewinding. So it's a little bit tricky. The bounce in also is a bounce out um, on the rewind. It sort of flips it for us. You have a rewind ease and can choose a different ease for different times as well. But anyway, so for instance, we could just ease a normal getting bigger and then um, re rewind ease be a bounce out at that point and then it would bounce out. Uh, okay, so where the heck are we now? Um, oh, look, same color though. That's what I was wanting to show you. Just it, it's staying the same color because we cached it. It just cached it at whatever color it was at the beginning. So for us to see that up, uh, that change in color, we need to that would that would be really bad for the game. We need to make sure we update the cache. Once we change the color of the body of the pumpkin, there we updated the cache and it changed color. Okay. So when you cache something, you can change its scale. You can change its rotation. You can change its skew, you can change its position, but if you change anything on the inside of it, such as its color, uh, or the color of one of its parts, or change one of the parts, move one of the parts, you need to update the cache, okay? And so that's how you do it. And by the way, you can't update the cache on something if it hasn't had the cache set. That'll just give you an error. What are we doing here? Animating whatever this is. Uh, the this is on the pumpkin. Uh, we're animating. Okay, that's just so that when it comes in, this is when it first arrives. We animate it from up to down, so it's sort of like I don't know, comes in and lands sort of thing. We don't need to look at that. Spinning. That's the mouse over. Oh, sorry, that's the mouse over on the spinning. We're nearly done. It looks like. Um, Anything to do here? No, not really. I think we talked about most of that stuff. Yeah. And the interface. All right. That was, we're going to make the tile. A selector is made from a tile. So this thing's called a selector right here. This is the interface. 
that's a selector. It's like a television thing, isn't it? Where it kind of moves around a bit like that. You can make it move diagonally if you want, but I, I kind of like the running along the track <laughs> sort of <laughs> look to it. But you can make it just go straight there on a diagonal if you wanted. Um, you could also make a straight line, like it could be a tile that's all one thing, and then the selector goes along that, and the selector can be more than just circles. This, by the way, if you had different size words or something like that, the selector actually dynamically changes size as it moves. It's pretty cool. All right, so that's the selector. We are taking away, we made the selector, and then we put it in place, and then we actually removed it so that we don't see it when... Well, I didn't have to refresh. I could have just put... Anyway, it, it's it's not... Like, I think the selector probably would have been seen behind this button. But now it's not. So here's the play button. We made it round by setting the corner to the same size. Although you can set a back a backing of a button to anything you want. It could be a kidney shape. or We have Zim Pizzazz shapes that are good for that as well. Or any custom shape or a picture. The label is very important, or sorry, the button is very important. The button has the most parameters probably out of anything. You can do all sorts of them. Here we're actually toggling, we're setting a toggle button so that when I press on it, play became pause and press it again and it becomes play. So that's a toggle button. You could have a wait in there. So it's got a wait state. So you might have a confirm attached to the wait. When I press it, it says confirm. And if you don't confirm in a certain amount of time, it goes back to the normal button. So that's built into the button as well. Um, icons, you can make icons for the buttons. You can make backings for the buttons. Obviously you can change all the roll colors, backing roll colors, toggle roll colors, etc. There's just tons of them. So there we are doing some of them. We're locating them at at the selector, setting itself to zero, and because we're going to animate it in right here. So there we are waiting one second and animating in the alpha. And then what else happens in the play button? When we tap it, so there's a short chainable tap, we do this. If it's toggled, we're going to animate it uh, down. So this is animating its X and Y and its scale. So that's what props do. You see, we. Uh, I think we've been only animating a single prop before, but you can animate a multiple bunch of things right there in 0.7. We're animating the X, the Y, and the scale to make this button go smaller and move over. Okay. And note the back in out. So as I press it, it moves this way and then it shoots down. When it shoots down, it goes past and comes back. So watch. Back, past, and back. I love that. Let's slow it down a little bit so you get to see that. Um, a bit better. This will only be on the making it smaller, the slowdown. So here we go. Back. Whoop. I did the alpha, but I could actually sort of see the alpha happening there. Woo. Okay. So that's a lovely one for moving things about um, back, you know. All right. Let's go back to point seven here. We do some other things too. We bring in the selector. So we set the alpha zero on the selector, animate it up to an alpha of one, and in that time after a wait. So this is adjusting a little bit of weight so that these all work together as they animate. We bring in the score as well, with a weight as well of more. So don't animate things all at once. Let, let people kind of see what's, see one animation and then the other. So here we are, I move that way, and then this comes in. So I saw the movement, this then faded in, and then in came our score. Going the opposite way, uh, we leave the score there. So fine. Um, else, we're animating the other way, and we're animating the selector. So great, nothing to do really with the score, just other than bringing the score in. So let's see, handle scoring comes next. Okay, how are you doing? We're up to almost two hours. This is quite a long one. I didn't really expect it to be that long, but we did spend a bit of extra time on this one, adding things like all that wiggle stuff of the, the and uh, so despite it looking like a pretty simple game, there's a lot of lot to talk about. A lot of uh, bonus features that you're seeing. Plus, if you're new to Zim, then uh, a little bit of an introduction to all the parts of Zim as well. 
Score. So we bring in a score. This comes from the game module. Remember way at the beginning we talked about it. We could have made a label. We could have put a background color on the label. We could have updated the labels.txt property with uh, some score variable that we stored. No problem at all. We know we've got a score. We've got a timer. So especially with the timer, timer's dead easy. New timer and go sort of thing. You can set if you want it to go up or down and what time to go to. So the score and the timer are quite similar. It's called a timer, so we call this a score. Quite often you want to keep a, a, a let score equal some, you know, 20 or something like that. And then you use the variable score. It makes it easier if, if that's not a new score and, you know, call this, that the score. So anyway, we just called it a score and a timer. Um, great. We use place for that. What place allows you to do is, well, we won't set the alpha to zero then. Um, what place allows you to do is we don't have a, a WYSIWYG editor like Flash does, for instance, or Animate, where you can uh, see this and move it around and then it just knows where it is. We decided against that. We started in on that kind of stuff, like a component making tool that allows you to visually build components. But uh, we just like the raw code. So place helps you out a little bit. If I, if I move it, see how it, get, it gets this little crosshair kind of showing you. So if I wanted it over here, we look at the console, F12, and every time I've dropped it, it's put a place, but there's, there's where it is. So object.loc, so whatever your object is, you can locate it at this amount right here. So there's our loc. In other words, we uh, press the wrong thing. Press the wrong thing, console. Um, copy this, copy, and paste it right here. And then when we start it again, run. It's right there. Okay, so that's how we handle uh, using place. Whenever we use place, we usually leave it in place, <laughs> but comment it out. So, oh, I better undo that. Um, we usually leave that commented out so that you guys can see that we've used place to figure out these weird numbers here. We're starting with an alpha of zero so that we can animate that in later. Actually, once we hit play, we animate it in. Here's the ticker. So is this where all the score is going? Yeah, and then we're at the end. Oh, we're at the end. Look at that. There's the document for all the items. So you can copy this if you wanted to see all those button parameters. Just copy that and go here and paste. And that takes you to the docs for the button. And there's all those darn parameters. Look at all those things. Wow. OK. And all the information about the parameters are right here. So here's what they all do. Then you have um, any methods uh, that the button uses, any properties that the button uses, and then any events specifically. But on a button, you'd probably just have a click event Etc. All right, uh, back to it. Right, so those are all, and we do that for every code pen. So every code pen, you'll be able to find that also in the comments. Come on into the comments, you guys, and give us a like or something like that. That would be nice. So where where are those likes? Oh, this is the fork. So <laughs> we don't. Oh, and it's a fork, so we don't have any comments either on that fork. So let me just show you that over here, not on the forks. Um, so these are the comments on Zim. So that's what we've made. Give it a like. So wherever you do that, I guess it's up here. You give it a like. There's your comments. So there's some references. And hey, where'd it go? Oh, come on. That's twice now. It must be too long. Um, too many links. That's twice now. We put that in there, but I guess we had too many links. Maybe we have to do double comments. I'll try that. Anyway, all the other Zims you'll find, uh, maybe this had too, too many of them. And for some reason, CodePen has decided that that's too many links in a comment. You're spamming us. Uh, but anyway, we do put these in there as well. And usually they, <laughs> usually they stay there. I swear, I promise. Uh, let's see the cat one. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that's there. It's not. Come on. Oh, I'm crying. Is that a new thing? They've shown up all the time before. Yay. Okay, so there they are. They're 
<laughs> but maybe maybe there's, I don't know, something new. Perhaps it's been happening all along. We didn't realize it. We just put them in there as a comment. They seemed to stay there. And then I didn't go back and look at them again. But anyway, that's what they look like. Then you can find out information on a slider. Here's information on the slider. Okay. So 18% the size of CSS animation. How about that? Okay. We're doing that sort of uh, scrolling thing. Anyway. So we're nearing completion. Let's, let's do the completion. Bum, bum, bum. Meanwhile, I have to figure out, I have to go back and look through those things and maybe put double comments in there. Obviously, you can see that some of them exist. Or... All right, score. A ticker. So what we're going to do is we're constantly, I don't know if you've noticed that, <laughs> a little bit annoying. This is one way to do it. We're constantly increasing that score, and that's 60 frames per second. Okay. So what are we doing? Uh, how we did that is we used ticker.add ticker.add, we add a function. So that runs 60 frames per second. This is very similar to request animation frame. If you know JavaScript, uh, the ticker uses request animation frame. But in that, it's like a queue of functions. Our animation uses ticker. Our wiggle uses the ticker. And it's always the same ticker. You see how it's right on the ticker class. It's not like we made a new ticker. Um, this is the same ticker, specifically so that everything that uses the ticker gets a single stage.update at the end of the queue. So that means that um, we don't have to worry about animating and updating the animate and then wiggling and updating the wiggle and, and all that. Like we just wiggle, we just animate, we do whatever. Um, we're going to do this stuff. And then once it finishes doing all those, a single stage.update and that saves your battery and makes it easy for us. Okay, so all of the Zim stuff that uh, like drag, zim drag, we'll use the ticker. Animate, wiggle, use the ticker. Anything, anything else like that uses the ticker. So uh, that means we're not wasting multiple stage.updates and stuff. So here's our ticker. If not play.toggled return. So we're only going to keep score if, uh, like as soon as I pause there, it stopped keeping score. As soon as I play, it starts keeping score. As soon as I pause, it stops keeping score. All right, so this is the score. If the selector's current items color, so the selector you know, selector isn't always used for colors. Actually, we could use a color picker for this. Never really thought of that. But anyway, selectors aren't always used for color. Usually, we use a color picker for that. Um, but whatever the select, we've got this tile, and the tile has items. So the current item is whichever one is selected, and so that happens to be the circle. So if its color is equal to the pumpkin's body, that's the pumpkin's body dot color. If those are the same, then we're going to set the border color of the selector selector. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, the selector is actually the the ring that goes around it. That's called the selector property of the selector. Um, we're changing its border color to green, and we're increasing the score by one. Uh, I suppose we could have just done a plus plus, huh? Okay, and here we could have done a minus minus, whatever. But we might have wanted a uh, higher score or a lower score. So we're increasing the score. Else, we're setting the border color to red, and we're decreasing the score. So the actual, the actual game of this is uh, pretty easy. Right? We're just comparing those two colors and increasing or decreasing the score. That's a little unusual having the speed of that score go. It's almost frantic feeling. Um, you, But do you see why we did it? We're letting people have time to choose the color. And if they take too long, they're losing score. And as soon as they choose the right color, then they get the right, uh, they, the score starts going up. And they get to keep that score going up until it changes again. And so that gives them a little bit of rest time. So it works well for um, this situation. All right, like I said, we're approaching two hours. We have now pretty well finished it. That's the little Zim logo right there. And our plan was to put a little YouTube logo here to this video. I'd like to do that for many of these. Uh, what we found is unfortunately on CodePen, people look at the CodePen and just stay there. They don't leave CodePen, which is okay for CodePen. <laughs> And people don't really look at these comments all that much because they're down here. You have to press on comments and like, who does that? Nobody. So it has been very hard to communicate with people on CodePen. 
it's nice that we can share things and see things and that's great but i don't think it's too great for actually communicating with people there's no way that i can message other developers aside from leaving a message on their code pen and everybody just they don't see that they might see it under their i don't know they just don't seem to respond to it very well they they uh, you know, so it'd be nice if you kind of came out. We've been making this stuff in Zim. We want you to try as well to make this stuff in Zim. Fork this thing. Uh, well, not this. This is a little bit complicated to fork. Like, why bother? But we have a lot of simple examples. Uh, we used to have under under here, I don't know about saving changes, but we used to have right in here the topics. They're not there anymore. Where the heck did they put the topics? They put it in the footer, and who sees the footer? Uh, so in the footer under community, there's topics. And there's Zim right here. So Zim's got uh, topics that you can see. And on those topics, there's lots of very basic ones. So there's some tutorials. Uh, there's the template. Here's some basic examples, but like just a drag, a simple draggable thing, 39 characters. Okay, dragging that around. Here's working with the blobs. There's working with the transforms. And next, and you can see how there's all sorts of them here. So you're welcome to see this and fork those. Uh, but another place to see them is just like come to the Zim site. And we you know, have a whole, whole list of things to do. <laughs> whole list of things to do with Zim. Lots of examples to see over here. There is actually a code pen section right here with a bunch of code pen examples all listed here if you really you know want to keep in code pen but there's lots of things outside of code pen as well that you can look at as well as this l big learn section right here so here's how you can learn how to do zim with a lot of videos as well there's the creative coding with zim zim basics if you know javascript then go to the Zim Basics. If you don't know JavaScript, come to the Learn JavaScript uh, on the Canvas, a great place to learn JavaScript. We're doing an Explorer right here. Code in five minutes. Uh, so those are video tutorials. If you're coming from Animate, there's a bunch of tutorials for that. Here's the creative coding tutorials on CodePen. If you're a kid, look at the kids or teach. Look at the kids. Zim School for uh, high school, college. And I, I teach at Sheridan Interactive Media. Zim, so you're welcome to come out there. Medium articles uh, and more tutorials, lots of tutorials. Those are sort of older tutorials or these things called Zim bits, but uh, whatever. All right. Uh, I am Dr. Abstract. This has been a Zim Explorer. Uh, we would love it if you come to Zim, check it out, and uh, have fun playing the pumpkin game too. <laughs> Cheers. Ciao.